So again, good afternoon to all of you. We are now on the discussion of still on the topic five pertaining to the pathophysiology framework, but on the on the concept that we have discussed last week is all about the risk factors. So we have identified the various risk factors that could basically be uh, included in your pathophysiology frame, uh, framework. As emphasized and reiterated during the time of our discussion of the risk factors, it is very relevant that uh, the physical examination findings, uh, subjective and objective data, patients, uh, patients' medical uh, and surgical history are those uh, informations that could be useful and relevant when it comes to designing the pathophysiology uh, diagram uh, diagrammatic uh, presentation or framework. It is very important that the competencies and skills of nurses when attending to our clients must manifest uh, efficiency and effectiveness because it matters on how it will give us a clear direction if the client through the identified risk factors will promote and prevent complications or expected, expected existence of a certain disease, disorders, or injury. This afternoon's uh, learning outcome will focus on the, as mentioned, pathophysiology framework, but on the etiology. Uh, risk factors could be identified as non-modifiable, modifiable, it could be lifestyle, and it could be social factors. It could be also uh, predisposing factors, which we have mentioned, uh, the key terms that are tendencies and that may contribute to the development of a disease or an injury. Uh, we have also, other than the predisposing factors, we have precipitating factors. So these are the factors that triggers, okay, that triggers the onset of the disease. And when we talk about the perpetuating, perpetuating factors, this uh, identifies the negative symptoms because of some health uh, beliefs. So these concepts are very important to significantly give direction on how the client uh, be identified with the initial uh, diagnosis or even final diagnosis as well on how the risk factors uh, contributed to the development of the disease. The etiology or the, the, the causes itself will give us the idea on how to give details on the identified risk factors on the pathophysiology framework. Actually, when we will differentiate the definition between etiology and etiologic agent. This is also related on the discussion before of the chain of infection and the periods of disease. It identified etiology as the concerns that the concerns it concerns the causative factors in particular disease, which the key term in the etiology is the pertaining to causative factors, okay? So if there, we, we are oriented with the cause and effect, if there is a cause, there is definitely effect. So the factors that we are identifying here are those that we have discussed uh, mainly on the risk factors. And what is the effect of these factors are the development of the disease. If we talk about etiologic agent, actually you've heard this causative agent in the discussion of the, uh, during the time of our discussion of the chain of infection. We have uh, the causative agent could be either microorganism or toxin, okay? Toxin that once enters our body, Initially, our body will do the compensatory mechanism. However, if the body may not compensate, then this may cause the possible imbalances or disequilibrium and mainly may lead to the possibilities of affecting our system, functions, and physiologic processes. So again, when we talk about etiology, these are the causative factors which its effect is in particular development of disease. 
If we talk about etiologic agent, this could be causative agent that could be microorganism or a toxin that are merely identified, okay, that are merely identified in the development, okay, in the development of a disease. Now, when we talk about... Hindi uh, nawalan po kaya ng audio. When we talk about etiology, do my audio is now clear? Okay na po. Okay, okay. Na po. Thank you. When it comes to the uh, etiology, one of the non-modifiable risk factors that we have identified are genes. Okay? And, and these genes could be identified accordingly of the possibility that may transfer a certain disorder or disease to the siblings, to the children, by generations. Genes are actually uh, uh, genes are actually responsible for the structural or functional defect. It means that our genes may mainly identify specific uh, nature. Okay, specific nature of the possibilities if we could have uh, if we could have inherit a certain type of disease, which uh, it could be possibility that that's why we have uh, familial. It could be congenital. Okay, that's why this inheritance could be discussed accordingly as we go on with the four types of genetic disorders. Some of these genetic disorders may identify topics in your pediatric nursing as well and is as well as in your obstetric nursing because it matters that this inheritance may specifically consider the problems with chromosomes. There are possibilities that uh, certain medical conditions from the paternal side or the maternal side may specifically be identified with your children. And if the family or the generation have already this uh, history in the genes, then there could be expectations that this may also pass into the next generation. So that's why we could do uh, preventive measures if you are aware of the newborn screening test. In the newborn screening test, we could uh, identify, okay, we could easily identify if there are some abnormalities uh, that may possibly, okay, that may possibly be considered to the newborn. And this could be preventive so that it could, uh, it could lead to the possibilities of prevention of complications and as well as on how we will prepare psychologically with the uh, identified conditions, okay, conditions of the newborn as it increases the develop, uh, age and uh, his development. Okay, now... Uh, there are four types of genetic disorder, and we will uh, proceed on the discussion one by one. We could have single gene inheritance, multifactorial inheritance, chromosome abnormalities, if you can still remember discussion of chromosomes of the X and Y, the X, X, and X, Ys. This will, uh, this will be discussed later. Uh, if ever there are missing, okay, there are missing chromosomes. If ever there will be excess in chromosomes. If ever there are problems specifically on the physical and uh, mental development. So usually, as what I've told you, that uh, mental development could be uh, affected pathologically, okay? But it is also at the same time genetically inherited. The fourth are considered as mitochondrial uh, inheritance. Uh, these are some of, actually some neurological, uh, most of the identified in the mitochondrial inheritance are neurological in nature. So let us discuss one by one on these types of genetic disorders. The first type of genetic disorder is the single gene inheritance. 
Okay. When we talk about genes, we are also talking about DNA. The deoxyribonucleic acid. It's actually in sequence, okay? And and when it comes to its mutation, okay, if there will be a DNA sequence of a single gene that cause this type of inheritance because we all know that the DNA is the one that that had been identified okay that are being identified in in situations uh, in situations that when for example as children of your parents the DNA can significantly match okay match accordingly because of the same structure that your parents have the sequence of the DNA. That's why it is um, measured by the percentage. The single gene inheritance is also called as Mendelian or Mendelian from the term itself. Mendelian is mono, okay, monogenetic, the term monogenetic inheritance. The, uh, why, why it is called as monogenetic inheritance? Because as what I've told you, with the DNA sequence, one single gene single gene okay one single or single gene affects this type of inheritance so if you will encounter okay if you will encounter history of clients that exist this type of excuse me genetic disorders to the family then genetic this genetic disease obviously are identified from the family themselves or from the immediate family themselves who are the parents and what are the common examples that are identified in single gene inheritance if you will encounter these cases then the possibility that it could be inherited but it is considered a single gene inheritance actually the single gene inheritance uh, are, are identified accordingly with the following okay so let us wait for the transition of our slides now. We have the single uh, gene inheritance. We will have an overview one by one on this. Some of the, the, the disorders have been uh, discussed in your pediatric nursing because most common, these are most common in, in pediatric nursing because most of the genetic disorders could be uh, congenital. But the congenital... Uh, problems could be uh, could be identified later now uh, with the first single gene inheritance the the examples are the following we have cystic fibrosis uh, cystic fibrosis are our problem with cystic fibrosis is that of it produces the the mucus secretion too much mucus secretions and in the cystic fibrosis, uh, these secretions may cause uh, possible obstruction of the, the gastrointestinal and the pancreas. So usually, the one that had been uh, responsible supposedly on the production of this mucous secretion are in the alveoli. But usually, when when a person had been identified with cystic fibrosis, the first question that you will ask, uh, do any of the family members, parents, have uh, been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis? So in cystic fibrosis, it affects two systems. Okay? It affects the gastrointestinal and at the same time the respiratory. In the respiratory, the most common that, that initially considered is the uh, excess production of mucus in the alveoli, which mainly travels accordingly to some ducts. If we say ducts, D-U-C-T-S, or passageway, these mucus secretions may cause obstruction, which somehow may cause obstruction to the some of the, the hepatic ducts and some of the pancreatic ducts, which may, which may mainly affect the functions of these organs will this be um, uh, will this be a worse condition health condition yes because uh, once it causes this obstruction 
it may mainly affect initially the respiratory system and thus the, the digestive process will be affected later once this excess mucous secretions will be what? Will travel on this uh, ducts or passageway. So later we'll have some of the uh, details on what are these cystic fibrosis. Okay, because if we say if we say fibrosis, these are the these are the possibilities by which tissues will be affected and may possibly lead to what may lead to death until it may not function as expected. Next is we have alpha and beta thalassemia. Okay, a thalassemia is a genetic disorder wherein this affects specifically the blood. Okay, so most common problem with the thalassemia is that of the form of the, we are familiar with the structure of the red blood cell as what you are seeing in the slide, it's rounded and compact. If you will, uh, if you will see in the slide, the illustration of other red blood cell. In thalassemia, microscopically, the red blood cells are malformed. There is malformation of the red blood cell, wherein this identifies a specific problem. And usually for thalassemia as, as, for, as considered as a genetic blood uh, disorder, this could possibly consider as a person may lead to anemia. Remember the discussion of the diagnostic process that thalassemia, okay, thalassemia is a microcytic, okay, microcytic anemia. And if I remember, there is no significant findings when it comes to the RDW. So in the RDW, it may not be significantly identified. And once this genetic disorder I identified to the person, which again may ask specifically the, the question if the parents or the immediate family members has this uh, disorder, then uh, anytime, okay, anytime, she may lead to the possibilities of bleeding because most and moreover, this also affects the clotting factors. Uh, as, as well as when it comes to the thalassemia, the problem because of the malformation of the red blood cell may lead to the risk of uh, bleeding. That's why it ends up with emia. Now, when it comes to the sickle cell, cell anemia, I know that you have we have also discussed this in our... Uh, diagnostic examination in the red blood cell. Uh, the the sickle, cell, sickle cell anemia, also called the sickle cells, may be also uh, commonly similar with thalassemia. But the difference when it comes to sickle cell anemia, actually, di ba, with the sickle... Hindi na walang purit kayo ng audio. Is it okay now? Okay. Is it already? Apo, okay, na. okay. Thank you so much. When it comes to the sickle cell anemia, the difference with the thalassemia is that of in thalassemia, there is malformation of the red blood cell. In the sickle cell anemia, the microscopically, the structure of the red blood cell is sickle cell type. Just like as a formation of a crescent structure, okay? Crescent, just like the moon, okay? Crescent moon uh, structure that can be seen microscopically. That's why it could identify both are anemia, but when, when we talk about sickle cell anemia, uh, this could identify specifically with the structure of the cell, which is the crescent-like structure which microscopically may differ to thalassemia on the malformation of the red blood cell okay next how about for the how about for the marfan syndrome 
later on on the Marfan syndrome, this may uh, significant. Uh, this is very significant when it comes to the physical uh, malformation. And this usually appears on the physical stature that, that may identify a difference with the left side or the right side. For example, when it comes to hands, when it comes to hands, if, if we will try to assess the, the problem with this, with the Marfan syndrome, there could be a problem with the uh, skeletal and joint structure of the Marfan syndrome. So later on, we will also discuss about hunting, hunting, Huntington's disease and the hemochromochromatosis. So these are the single gene inheritance, which when you encounter these terms, this could be inherited, this could be non-modifiable risk factors, because it is through the genes and it could be identified with the single gene inheritance. It is also called as Mendelia. Now, let us now proceed on the discussion of what cystic fibrosis is. Okay. When it comes to the cystic fibrosis, as what I have told you, these are genetically uh, inherited hereditary disease that usually affects the lungs and the digestive system. Usually, as what I have told you, the body will continuously, will continuously produce very thick and sticky mucus. The, this, mucus this mucus secretion is the one that may primarily, okay, that may primarily clog the lungs or will cause the obstruction of the lungs. And at the same time, this may cause the possibility of obstruction of the pancreas. We all know for a fact that the pancreas' main function are also endocrine in nature. And this produces specifically, uh, the, the pancreas also produces enzymes and it also produces hormones of insulin. And the insulin is very important in the breakdown of the blood glucose. The problem if the pancreas will not, uh, no, will not produce these enzymes, the problem is it may lead to malabsorption problem. The nutrients that are supposedly be absorbed may not be possible. If, for example, the nutrients just as basic products of carbohydrates, basic products of the protein and fats, may lead to the possible malabsorption because the, the pancreas is the one that secretes those enzymes and promote absorption. So mainly, if you will try to consider this and have an analysis on this, in cystic fibrosis, it may lead to the possibility of problem with what? Problem with oxygenation. Then the other one is that of it may cause a problem with mal nutrition or malabsorption syndrome, okay? So those malnutrition and malabsorption syndromes are mainly because of the effect of the obstruction of the pancreas. And as what I've emphasized to you, that the pancreas is the one that secretes enzymes, which is very important for absorption of nutrients. So these are cystic fibrosis. Next, other than the cystic fibrosis, let us now proceed with the alpha and the beta thalassemia. Question, sir, what's the difference between the alpha and between the beta thalassemia? Our body has this alpha globin and the beta globin. Alpha and beta globin are very important because it balances what? it balances the production of the red blood cell or what we call erythropoiesis. An imbalanced globin chains may cause hemolysis and may impair erythropoiesis. If we say it may cause problem with hemolysis, this may prevent specifically the red blood cell when it comes to reproduction. When we talk about erythroporesis, it's the process of the production of the red blood cells. 
So eventually, if there will be an impair in the production of the red blood cell, the volume itself, what will happen? The volume will be decreased. And if the volume will be decreased, the client may lead to anemia. Thus, the client could be subject for what? The client could be subject for a pos possible intervention because these are the clients, the patients with thalassemia may lead to the possibilities that they are at risk of bleeding. Now, usually when it comes to when it comes to thalassemia, it could be reduced or it could be absent. Okay, absence of alpha or beta globin. So again, both may have anemia, but the difference, uh, but, but the similarity of the alpha and the beta globins are obviously it may affect the erythropoiesis. If you will try to see in the uh, projection on our slide that the the basic structure of the the red blood cell are rounded and compact while when when a person may have thalassemia okay the difference is there is already a malformation of the red blood cell of this type of structure which later you will encounter or you i will present to you the difference between the sickle cell anemia so malformed red blood cell for thalassemia chances of bleeding question sir are this client uh, are are the is thalassemia can be corrected with the blood transfusion actually no it could just only correct the level of the red blood cell but it may not treat thalassemia it may control bleeding it may temporarily correct the level of the 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 blood the red blood cell but it may not what it may not treat thalassemia so next how about the sickle cell anemia the sickle cell anemia is again an inherited red blood cell disorder which the red uh, blood shape like sickles or crescent moons if you will see on an actual microscopic view of the, the red blood cells, these are, these are the common view of the red blood cell structure, which is as what I've told you, compact and rounded. But if you will see the presence of other, other crescent and sickle uh, RBCs on the microscopic view, these are the sickle cell anemia. Okay, so the difference, uh, the difference only with the thalassemia and the sickle cell anemia is the basic structure of the red blood cell. While on this screen, this is the normal red blood cell, the white blood cell and the platelet as well. This is the red blood cell, but if you will see, the sickle cell anemia has the sickle shape and crescent moon-like shape of the type of anemia that's why it's called a sickle cell so if you will uh, if you will see on the slide it looks like a crescent moon okay next how about marpan syndrome actually in the marpan syndrome the most common problem okay the most common problem is related to the connective tissue and we all know that connective tissues are very important when it comes to the function of the skeletal system and the bones. Marpan syndrome is considered as connective tissue disorder. And if you have seen in the slide, uh, this is the normal hands okay, with the normal size. While in the Marban, Marpan syndrome, the, the fingers and the arm bones are elongated. Okay. Uh, elongated as, as, as expected supposedly with the size uh, of the hands and the arms. But you will, uh, if you will encounter the case of Marpan syndrome, the, the size of the fingers and the arm, born, arm bones rather are longer than usual. 
because of the problem with connective tissues. So if the family members or immediate family members have history of the Marfan syndrome, then this could lead to the possibilities that it could be hereditary or it could be inherited by the children. Next. So this is uh, what we call single... single. In may tanong po ako. Ah, yes, yes. Yung Marfan syndrome po ba, seryosa po ba siya na nakaka-apekto sa day-to-day -day activities ng tao? Actually, uh, actually, when it comes to, to the mobility, okay, when it comes to the mobility of the arms and, and the hands, uh, it, may not, it may not affect the activities of daily living. However... The, the problem with the problem with too much elongated arm, uh, arm bones and the fingers is it may cause the possibility of concern with grasping of objects it may concern also because when a common common size of the hand may grasp uh, strongly an object but if there will be an elongated uh, fingers there could be a possibility that it may limit the grasping those, those are a typical example of limitations, but it may not totally affect the activities of daily living. Did I answer you your question? Din. Thank you so much. Apo. Now, if you will try to, to check on the single gene inheritance of the Marfan syndrome, paternal and the maternal, in this diagram, the genome diagram, uh, um, the mother without the Marfan syndrome, then the father has been identified with Marfan syndrome. Now, with the four children, okay, four children, uh, the possibility, okay, the possibility that two out of four, two out of four may develop the possibility of Marfan syndrome. If, for example, the possibility that the Marfan syndrome were inherited from the paternal side as based from the studies. So if you will notice with the four, usually it identifies specifically the, the first and possibly the last okay, of the, the siblings. But, it, but this pattern could be changed. Uh, the study shows that when, when Marfan syndrome had been identified with the paternal side, almost 50% of the children, okay, 50% of the children may have the Marfan syndrome, okay? So these are based from the studies. So next, let us now proceed with the Hunting, Huntington's disease. Uh, the Huntington's disease are usually uh, 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 usually identified with neurological problems, specifically with the central nervous system. And in the central nervous system, usually there is a progressive brain disorder that by which a defective gene has been identified as the cause. If we say progressive brain disorder, uh, in, in Huntington's disease, usually affected, the affected uh, concerns for persons who may have this are movement, mood, and thinking skills. If we say progressive, the possibility that it may start with problems with movement, second, it may affect the mood, Sooner or later, it may affect the thinking skills. So it's progressive. So it could be on a fast pace. It could be on a slow pace, meaning by age, it may, it may manifest immediately. But there are some situations that it may manifest these problems on the later age. So once you have encountered hunting, Huntington's disease as a progressive brain disorder, the, the doctors and the specialists will always say that there is one portion of, there is one gene that has been defective. 
So what what why why defective? Defective meaning that's why we have identified identified uh, Huntington's a single uh, single gene inheritance because one gene is defective and one gene that had been affected may affect DNA. DNA sequence once affected may cause the problem with changes and mutations. So somehow the the one that the one that had been identified with Huntington's disease significantly affect the central nervous system, specifically the central area of the brain. And usually you can you can you can identify specifically as what I mentioned that initially it may affect primarily movement, sooner the mood, soon thinking skills. Sir, it may ano ba? It may uh, it may vary the sequence. There could be a possibility that no, it, po ulit kayo ng audio. there's a possibility that may affect the sequence. Is it already revived? Okay, na po. okay thank you so much for reminding. Uh, there could be a possibility that the three areas may, may, may vary the sequence. There could be a possibility that the, the, the thinking skills will be affected, then the mood, then movement. Because it may it may depend on the certain degree of the affectation of the central area of the brain. Because we all know that the brain are divided into lobes and, and hemispheres as well that are significant when it comes to movement, thinking, and mood. So once identified that the defective genes significantly affect the part of the brain responsible for movement, then initially the mobility comes first when it comes to affectations okay so next other than the huntington's disease we have the we have the hemochromatosis hemochromatosis is a disorder where too much iron builds up in your body okay class situations situations like that uh, a, a while ago we have talked about uh, problems with the malabsorption of nutrients and that is identified specifically with what that is identified specifically with the problem on what on the uh, ones that had been identified with the clogging of the, the respiratory system and uh, the problem with the pancreas so we have the cystic fibrosis now in hemochromatosis uh, this is a, a disorder that basically affects the blood because we all know that the iron are carried by the, by the blood. That's why when, when there are some problems with anemia, okay, so the, 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 the opposite, okay, the opposite of the, the iron deficiency anemia is hemochromatosis because in here, iron overload uh, will build up to your body and actually any excess in the uh, amount in the body may lead to the possibility of toxic okay toxic level and this may not be uh, helpful when it comes to the cellular functioning okay so we have identified the single gene inheritance we will now proceed with the multifactorial inheritance. If we say multifactorial inheritance, uh, we have mentioned that the single gene are also called as Mendelian, and these are monogenetic inheritance. If we say multifactorial inheritance, these are also called as complex or polygen inheritance. Uh, usually, the multifactorial inheritance could be a combination of problem with problem with genes and a combination specifically with environmental factors okay so that's why it it identifies as multifactorial inheritance so sir so it's clear that the difference between single gene inheritance and multifactorial inheritance the, the only difference is that of in multifactorial it added environmental factors so you are correct so what are those uh, disorders or diseases 
that are basically identified with multifactorial inheritance. Ayan. So these are the common. That's why when you're about to discuss in your in your ano uh, in your pathophysiology and if it is familial okay we are talking about familial history and genetically inherited so these are the only multifactorial inheritance so but but you may explore an other multifactorial inheritance that's why a person or a within the family members or the parents if they do have any of this the possibility that this could be considered as non modifiable risk factors that's why when you will explain this to to your panel or to the panel or why you consider diabetes as uh, non modifiable risk factors because it is included in one of the four types of genetic disorders indicated under multifactorial inheritance. And under the multifactorial inheritance, diabetes can be inherited from generations. So that basically, and, and affected by the other environmental factors. That's why, as what I've told you, diba, these diseases or disorders may appear also as modifiable risk factors. Why? Because in certain situations like diabetes, why diabetes also as modifiable risk factors? It is called as non-modifiable if it is identified, okay, ha? if it is identified within the family members that inherited from generation and from the family members, then include it as non-modifiable multifactorial inheritance. But if the client had been identified as diabetes but no history, no familial history of diabetes, it's excluded in the non-modifiable, diabetes could be considered as modifiable based from the diagnosis identified from the results of diagnostic exam, which is probably urinalysis or fasting blood sugar. Now, Sir, is there a possibility that diabetes could be at the same time uh, non-modifiable and modifiable? Answer is yes. If the, if the client has history of um, diabetes with the family member, paternal or maternal, it is considered as non-modifiable multifactorial inheritance. Again, on the time that the client had been identified with diabetes, and it was validated through the results of diagnostic examinations, then that could be modifiable risk factors because uh, blood sugar can be what? Blood sugar can be controlled, okay? It can improve through environmental factors. So in these situations, in these situations, uh, we could uh, easily identify when to use some diseases or disorders as modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Again, if this, uh, if the diagnosis of the client had been identified through the results of diagnostic examinations, it's modifiable risk factors. If it is inherited by genetically inherited hereditary familial history, it's non-modifiable risk factors. So these are the examples of the multifactorial inheritance. In the multifactorial inheritance, we have problem with heart diseases, history of hypertension, Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, this concerns with the damage of the tissues of the brain and it is inherited. So when, when we go back to our discussion of the Alzheimer's disease, what what gender specifically common ang Alzheimer's disease? Is it for male or female? Female. 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 Very good. It's female. And because for male, it's more on the Parkinson's disease, right? If you remember that. Kaya males, male students, please ask the family, okay, the family, the, have a genodiagram, genogram, <laughs> to identify if uh, the family uh, members, specifically by generation, has history of Parkinson's disease. For female students, you may have genogram 
to identify if their history of Alzheimer's disease uh, within the generation. And this usually affects female. So this is considered as non-modifiable risk factors. Arthritis, okay. Arthritis from the term itself, inflammation of the joints. This could be either osteoarthritis affecting already the bone, gout, uh, gout, uh, gouty arthritis, which is basically because of the uh, increased uh, level of the uric acid. So any of these mentioned arthritis are multifactorial inheritance. Why it is considered as multifactorial inheritance? Because this could be affected also by environmental factors. Aside from if it is familiar, if in the lifestyle as well, this affects specifically the way that it should have been controlled, then it could be considered as multifactorial inheritance. Other than that, we have arthritis, diabetes, cancer, which I have mentioned unto you based from the studies and findings citing in the cancer, uh, Philippine Cancer Society that the, when a person or when the parents or by generation has this uh, has a type of cancer, it can be possibly inherited by the siblings by 30%. Okay, so you must at least be considered to have preventive measures for diagnostic examination. So let, you must be ano ha, you must be uh, aware of what to test if you have a uh, history of cancer for purposes of prevention. Obesity is also a multifactorial inheritance. So that's why if in the uh, these are affected by the en environmental factors as well because, again, by the discipline that you may have to control supposedly, but um, if nutritional management is significantly affected, then this may lead you to possibilities of obes obesity. And if the persons... If the persons who have history of uh, familiar history of obesity may not engage themselves into lifestyle change and enhancement, then if you will notice, if you have history of uh, obesity in the family, it, 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 it could easily gain weight and change uh, the physical stature. Uh, and features as well if you have history of obesity. So these are the multifactorial inheritance. Let us now proceed with chromosome abnormalities. Let us now again review what is single gene inheritance, multifactorial inheritance. In single gene inheritance, it is called as Mendelian. It is a monogenetic inheritance. This is affected by the DNA sequence, which significantly affects a single gene a problem with mutations or changes with the genes. If we say multifactorial inheritance, these are problems with the mutations of multiple genes and at the same time uh, influenced by environmental factors. When we talk about chromosome abnormalities, in chromosome abnormalities, um, this could be also uh, this could be also detected through the newborn screening. Okay, that's why it is very important that the newborn will be subject for screening, a screening rather once delivered. And this could be at least, this could at least prepare, this could at least prepare psychologically the parents and the uh, newborn uh, himself. Usually when it comes to chromosome abnormalities, the problem is with the cell division. This emphasizes with the cell division because we are aware of the XX chromosome and the XY chromosomes. There are some chromosome abnormalities that are only identified with female and there are chromosome abnormalities that are significantly identified more on males. So these are, the next slide will show to you the list of chromosome abnormalities. Okay, the chromosome abnormalities are the following. We have Turner syndrome, okay. On the Turner syndrome, we have lacking or missing 
uh, missing a chromosome. There's lacking a chromosome. That's why it is represented only as 45 and X zero because the zero represents a missing chromosome. And usually Turner syndrome are very much common with female. Okay. For the Klinefelter syndrome, the Klinefelter syndrome is we have uh, an excess in the chromosomes. Okay. There is an increase in the chromosomes. That's why it, it is represented by XXY. So more X. Okay. So that's why uh, in the Klinefelter syndrome, usually uh, affected gender are males. And in, if you will, uh, if we will analyze XX uh, chromosome, and it has also XY, there are some features of uh, the female features that appears to a male. Okay, so that's why uh, this Klinefelter syndrome is because of the chromosome abnormalities. Again, in Turner syndrome, the problem is. There's a missing chromosome or there's lacking chromosome, which usually uh, uh, for Turner syndrome, more uh, the, the common features that are usually identified are those who may have uh, problems specifically on, uh, on the hormones. Okay, so later on, we'll try to discuss what are Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome are more, most common for female and Klinefelter syndromes are common for male. How about Kriduchat? Okay, the Kriduchat syndrome, uh, there is uh, a sequence in the DNA that is lacking. And usually, the, the chromosomes may have 46. It could be XX or XY. But there is a missing link when it comes to the sequence. The missing link in the uh, sequence is the 5P minus in the sequence of the DNA. I may not go further on the explanation of the sequence of DNA, but the sequence of the DNA significantly identifies the pattern. But if the 5P, that's why it's minus because it's missing, if the 5P is missing in the DNA sequence, then that is Kriduchat syndrome. In the Kriduchat syndrome, usually the one of the features and identified uh, uh, features for the Kriduchat syndrome is usually the, the 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 newborn cries high pitch and just like a cat, a sound of a cat. So that's why it's it's mentioned also as it's also called as a uh, cry of the cat. Okay. So another chromosome abnormalities that we may have is Down syndrome. Okay, in Down's, Down syndrome, it is also called as trisomy 21. And later on, I will discuss why it is also called as trisomy 21. We all know in the Down syndrome, uh, we, can, we can identify persons who may have Down, Down syndrome or who may have features on the physical and may have the mental uh, limitations. So later on, I'll discuss this further. So if any of these chromosome abnormalities runs through the family, then uh, by genes, this could be inherited or hereditary. So let's start first with the Turner syndrome. In the Turner syndrome, these are conditions that basically uh, affects the uh, female, okay? And usually the X chromosomes or sex chromosomes is missing or partially missing with the female. Okay, we have identified for females the XX chromosomes. So the one that is missing is the what? The other X chromosomes. In Turner syndrome, it is missing. So that's why most of the most of the features that are identified with that are identified with the uh, uh, Turner syndrome are the following a client who may have a web neck what do you mean by web neck the neck is almost almost uh, the same 
in 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 the proportion with the head okay usually low hairline low hairline and usually uh, they are identified with low set of ears low set of ears web neck okay web neck and uh, usually uh, complications for turner syndrome those those may have problem with the the uh, left side if i'm not mistaken with the left side of the heart okay the bulbs locate what are the bulbs that could be identified on the left side of the heart we have the mitral bulb or the bicuspid bulb and the aortic bulb so usually these bulbs may lead to coarctation okay and usually these are the affected uh, affected portion to per, per patients with turner syndrome another is uh usually may have a problem uh, this this turner syndrome may have abnormalities with ovarian uh ovarian and this may lead to the possibility of hormonal imbalance uh usually uh, Patients with Turner syndrome experiences amenorrhea. So there's absence of the, the menstruation and possibility of chances that may lead to the infertility. Okay. Uh, usually, when it comes to physical features, Turner syndrome may have a short, uh, short metacarpal bones. Okay. And, and usually... Uh, widely, uh, widely spaced uh, nipples po ang identified for Turner syndrome. So, if you will notice, one of the features that could be identified with Turner syndrome is web neck. That's why, if you will see in the dial in the illustration, there is a uh, a foot of the duck. Yung foot ng duck that that best describes the neck. Okay, that best describes the neck of the person with Turner syndrome. And if you will, if you will see specifically on the on the screen above portion, we have the we have a photo that had been ident that had been gathered from the, our search engine of Google. If you will see, this is a typical uh, typical picture of a web neck for Turner syndrome. So what is lacking? X chromosome is lacking. So most common problem that may lead to the complications of Turner syndrome is heart disease, specifically coarctation of aorta or problems with the, the bicuspid or the aortic bulb. So next, other than the Turner syndrome, let us now proceed with the Klein-Felter syndrome. In the Klein-Felter syndrome, usually... We have identified, we have identified for Klinefelter only supposed the XY. But for the Klinefelter syndrome, it identifies XXY. So supposedly it has only 46, but it has an excess chromosome of X. Usually, uh, this genetic condition results to the possibility that the most considered uh, features are the testicular growth. Most, most uh, males who may have normal testicular uh, growths, for Klinefelter, it has a smaller testicles because uh, they have smaller testicles because of the lower production of the testosterone. So because it is significantly with the uh, excess X chromosome, it, it contradicts the secretion of the testosterone. Usually, if you will see on the upper portion of the slide, a significant picture of a Klinefelter syndrome, usually uh, breast uh, may develop in the 30% of the cases. Huh? So for Klinefelter, some males may develop breast, but it's only by 30%. And by physique, uh, PSIC usually uh, because of the, the presence of another X chromosome, the features of, of expected female somehow appears to the male, okay, the, the male identified male uh, person. 
the pubic hair pattern may be similar to may be similar to also to the the female and since uh, there is lower production of testosterone the male may have decreased production of hair okay so decrease in the hair growth and usually they are prone to osteoporosis okay uh, the problem with the Klinefelter syndrome when it comes to mental abilities uh, they have the, the tendency to to at least have impaired uh, IQ or intelligence quotient. By, by thoracic, by the thorax or by the chest, they have the tendency to lose chest hairs because of the decreased uh, production of the uh, testosterone. Male individ this male uh, individual who may have Klinefelter may have poor beard growth. So because again of the problem with testosterone. Uh, there could be a possibility of frontal baldness because again of the possibility of the testosterone. That's why testosterone may, may facilitate the hair growth. Eh? And this may limit to the patients or individuals who may have Klinefelter syndrome. So they may have small testes because of the problem or lower production of testosterone. Okay, so these are the Klinefelter syndrome. In Turner syndrome, we lack X chromosome, while in the Klinefelter syndrome, there is an excess X chromosome, but it has a complete also of the XY. Okay, next, let us now proceed with the Credo chat. Okay, a Credo chat is an chromosomal abnormality. So it could be XX or XY. So the XS, uh, XX for female, XY is for male. But uh, the chromosomes are, 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 are significantly normal. But if, if in these conditions, uh, the one that has been affected is basically the sequence because it's 5P minus. That's why it is also called the credo chat. It's also called as 5P minus syndrome because the 5 is missing. And usually... As what I have mentioned, as what I have mentioned unto you, that the high pitch cry, okay, is sound. A high pitch cry sound is like that of a cat. Okay, I may not, uh, no, I may, <laughs> I may not uh, mimic it, but try to imagine a cat who been fallen from the ceiling or from the, uh, no, from the rooftop. Okay, expect with a high pitch sound of that cat. So that is the sound that you may imagine or that we may imagine for a client who may have credo chat syndrome. And if you will notice, these are these are the pictures, the physical pictures of patients with credo chat syndrome. Usually, their uh, uh, pictures have the downward pictures, specifically on the palpebral pictures. Okay, palpebral is in this part. Okay, palpebral fissures are are downward, and usually uh, they have large head. Okay, they have large head compared to face. Okay, so the 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 face has small but large. It may be compared somehow with a hydrocephalus, but the difference is that of the the identified. Uh, uh, neck portion is uh, shorter. Okay, the the small chin. Okay, small chin and the neck are short. So these are these are the the credo chat syndrome. Let us now proceed with Down syndrome. Down syndrome is also called as trisomy uh, twenty one. Why? Because uh, in the Down syndrome. The 21st chromosome, okay, the 21st chromosome has an extra copy, okay? It means that there is an excess of that chromosome which is specifically identified with the 21st chromosome, okay? So this is somehow a concern again with the sequence of the, of the chromosome. However, the chromosomes that had been produced on the 21st sequence has an extra and with this extra chromosome, this may significantly affect the physical and the mental developmental delays and disabilities. So 
what you may be seeing are the features, okay? This is the what we mentioned, the sequence, or these are the sequence of the chromosomes from 1 to 22. And at the 21, okay, at the 21, if you will notice, we have only a pair of chromosomes. But once it appears on this 21st chromosome, there is an additional chromosome on the 21st. And that mat makes uh, uh, a difference with other chromosomes. That's like in other chromosomes, it's, it has a chromosome abnormalities. It has excess X, but in here, it is identified in the sequence of the 21st has an extra chromosome. So it could be an X or it could be an Y, but the sequence itself is identified in the 21st uh, chromosome. So most of the features usually are on the facial features, typical facial features, okay? Usually, uh, usually when it comes to, to the physical features, when it comes to the single, uh, they, may, they may have single palmar ano, crease, okay? Diba in our hands, we have creases, okay? But for, but for the patients with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, single crease only appears. Okay. That is uh, one that have been identified. So these are the tri trisomy 21 or the Down syndrome. Now, let us now proceed with the what we call mitochondrial inheritance. The mitochondrial inheritance, these are caused by the mutation of non-nuclear DNA of the mitochondria. So what does it mean? Um... This usually gives us a pattern of just like uh, what we have discussed a while ago that when a father may have a Marfan syndrome, two of the two of the what you call this two of the children out of four may have the Marfan syndrome. In the mitochondrial in the mitochondrial syndrome it will identify based from studies okay based from studies the number of male and female children just like in the diagram or in the illustration that i am showing unto you in the mitochondrial inheritance we have the affected mother okay with the affected mother the affected children could be what the affected children could be two uh, two among the, the males may have this may have this inherited and one for the one female among the children. For the affected father, for the affected father, uh, usually one male, okay, one male will be affected. And two of the female children, uh, two of, I'm sorry, when when the father is affected, okay, when the father is affected, there will be unaffected children of two, two female and one male. So let's let's try to have a clear, know, clear perspective on this. If the mother is affected, affected children could be two male among the children and one female. On the other hand, if the father is affected with the inheritance unaffected we're talking about unaffected children it could it could not be it could not be inherited by the two female children and one male children so it's 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 obviously patterned okay so we could identify that amongst the children na if there is uh, inherited hereditary uh, inherit hereditary disease of the affected mother, regardless of the number, two, two of them, two of them of male could be affected and one female. But if the father, okay, if the father is affected, there could be unaffected children of two female and one male. So these are these are the these are the common patterns for mitochondrial inheritance. And what are the example? Most common example of mitochondrial inheritance is the LON, L-H-O-N. It's an eye disease. So that's why whenever uh, the family has history of LON, it's Leber's hereditary optic atrophy. If we say atrophy, it's, uh, it's a problem with the cell, with the size of the cell. The cell becomes 
the cells become smaller in size as expected. And if it is smaller in size, this may significantly affect its function. From the illustration that I am showing to you on the screen, there could be a possibility. This is letter A, letter B, letter C, and letter D. For those who may have Leber's hereditary optic atrophy, the atrophy, the atropide could be a smaller, it becomes smaller. That will uh, basically affect your visual. This is what a person may see. This is what a person may see if the person may have Leber's hereditary optic atrophy. The center may not be clear. It is uh, blurred or black. It can only see the sides of, of the, the visual. So it could be a visual impairment. So if the family may have history, this is a mitochondrial inheritance. So as what, I, uh, what we had mentioned, if, it, if there is an affected mother, there will be, there will be two uh, males, male children that could be affected and one female. So for the, ano, for the father, an unaffected could be, unaffected could be one male and two female children. So another example of mitochondrial inheritance is the myoclonic epilepsy with rag red fibers. Very rare, very unusual. But once, but once uh, this could uh, significantly affect the appearance by the MRI of this red structure of the red fibers, okay, red fibers, you could be at risk of epilepsy. That's why when a person experiences epilepsy, try to ask if the parents have history of epilepsy. And the usual epilepsy that are inherited in nature is the myoclonic epilepsy with rag red fibers. And that rag red fibers is the one that is very significant in the findings that causes damage to the fibers of the nerves. If you will notice in this illustration, this is the physical feature of a patient with myoclonic epilepsy with drug red fibers, okay? So protruded at the lower, lower neck part because of the possibility of the damage with the red fiber, uh, red fi uh, with damaged fibers of the nerves, nervous system, of the nerves rather. So another mitochondrial inheritance is the what we call melas. Melas is mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Um, class, in short, this is a rare form of dementia. Okay, so what is dementia? Dementia usually affects memory. Okay, that's why when you encounter a dementia, a problem with memory loss as it increases the age, then as the family members, if uh, a family member or parents have history of the dementia, which is main, mainly the, the, the common form of dementia is this melas, okay? The mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, stroke-like episodes, because obviously the one that ha had been affected is the brain. Unlike the other one, the myoclonic epilepsy, the one that has been affected is epilepsy because the nerve transmissions are, are, are affected. In here, the one that has been affected is significantly the central area of the brain, which is uh, pertaining to the role of the function rather of memory, so dementia. So those have been identified as mitochondrial inheritance. Let us now proceed with congenital anomalies. I know, again, that this has been introduced to all of you in your, um, uh, in your pediatric nursing or somehow it could still be discussed. Congenital anomalies are also called as birth defects. So usually, malformations happen in the intrauterine. Okay, in intrauterine. However, 
uh, birth defects could be congenital disorders. If you say congenital because it developed, okay, it is developed uh, in the intrauterine life and congenital malformation could be cause of the various risk factors. So congenital anomalies, okay, congenital anomalies could be either structural or functional anomalies. And usually, these congenital anomalies are, are happening in the intrauterine life or prenatal, which there could be possibilities that it may not be, okay, it may not be physically in the intrauterine life, but it could, it could be on the later uh, part of life of the person. That's why, for example, in the newborn, we may not identify problems already with chromosomes unless the client or the newborn undergone the screening. So just, just for purposes of identifying any problem. So congenital anomalies uh, could be considered as a non-modifiable okay, risk factors because it happened already on the intrauterine life of the, the, the baby or the newborn. Now, it could be structural or uh, functional anomalies. If we say structural disease or anomalies, usually it involves physical and biochemical changes. What do you mean by that? Uh, it is called as organic disease because usually uh, the, the anomalies happen if it appears uh, on the physical, okay, physical features. It usually when the baby, uh, when the baby uh, has the intrauterine life already, it can identify physical or anatomical in the structure because it can be identified through specific uh, test or radiographic test. So usually bio biochemical changes that are result with the abnormal metabolism. So uh, as, as, we define, as we define the structural disease as an organic disease, structural disease or structural changes in cells are initiated by two types, okay? So it could be exogenous. If we say exogenous, those that are external. Example, uh, trauma, chemical injury, microbial infections. These are exogenous. So it, it means that the, the fetal development are affected by structural, okay, by structural changes in the cell brought about by trauma. So what do we mean by trauma? Physical trauma that may significantly uh, affect the, the mother and directly affects the, the, the fetal development or the, the baby inside the womb. While the chemical injury is when the person is exposed to environmental hazards and another, it could be exogenous uh, uh, structural, it could be structural disease if the person is exposed to microbial infections. So, just like, for example, if you remembered about the Zika virus, okay, the Zika virus, when, when the pregnant mother, the, and the, the Zika virus uh, is carried by mosquitoes, okay. So uh, mosquitoes are the ones that are considered as reservoir. And uh, the portal of uh, exit of this uh, reservoir is through this mosquito and transfer to to the possible host so with the pregnant mother zika virus may cause congenital uh, anomalies so that's one of the 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 disease that had been identified before so exogenous so when we talk about endogenous okay for endogenous these are usually internal okay internal uh, usually, uh, if there is a specific vascular insufficiency, example, um, endogenous internal vascular blood vessels. So if, for example, if the, the maternal circulation affects the fetal circulation, then that is endogenous. That's internal. Okay, unlike for the exogenous, most it is common by the hazards, infection, environmental hazards, chemical chemical uh, hazards. So while in this situation, the combination is the combination or the role of the maternal health 
affects the the fetal development. As what I've told you, it could be vascular insufficiency, meaning uh, maternal circulation may not be sufficient for the fetal circulation. Another, immunological or autoimmune reactions. Immunological or autoimmune reactions if the, the mother have experienced uh, hypersensitivity reactions, if the mother experienced allergic reactions, so these allergic reactions may significantly affect immune system of the fetus. So another and this uh, and other diseases that are result from abnormal metabolism. So you can now differentiate exogenous and endogenous as the structural disease. Now, to have a broader category of structural disease, usually structural disease on the broader categories could be on the following. That's why as what I've told you, diba, if the person may have history of, of this as non-modifiable risk factor aside from what we have identified in the single inheritance and the multifactorial inheritance, this could be also considered as the one that may lead to congenital anomalies, which structural disease could be broader categories and types. Autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease, body's, body's immune system attacks its own cells and tissues. So it means that, that, that during this time, because of the immune system itself, the, the, common, the common cells that supposedly, that supposedly depend the body on the infection, they're the ones that has a conflicting role. Usually, this, this causes the what we call uh, immunocompromise. Yeah, immunocompromise. So, situations. So, one of the typical example of autoimmune disease are type 1 diabetes. Okay, because problem with blood sugar and it break down, it, it, break, uh, it, it limits specifically the, the transport of oxygen and may affect immune system because it may affect cellular metabolic activity. Multiple sclerosis, the multiple sclerosis, this usually affects the nerve, uh, the nerve uh, sheet, okay? The nerve sheet may be affected and it may not uh, uh, take its part when it comes to transmission or electrical transmission, which is very necessary for the immune, uh, autoimmune response of the body. Arthritis, as what I've told you, okay, could be a non-modifiable, and at the same time, these are identified also as multifactorial. However, this is also considered as autoimmune. That's why always take it to, to consideration uh, 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 most of the autoimmune disease. These are the diseases that, that attacks uh, the body and primarily affects immune system, which I mentioned also the lupus because the lupus may cause the possibility of the problem with the kidney. And another is we have the psoriasis. This is an autoimmune uh, auto uh, disease, which mainly uh, affects the, the skin cells. And, and the, there are no treatment at all when it comes to psoriasis. It can only be supportive. Um, usually, for those who may have psoriasis, they are very sensitive to heat. To air, they are very sensitive to to food. So that's why um, there must be ano, there must be proper knowledge on how to to manage the psoriasis. So also the same with the lupus, which mainly affects the immune system. So and usually lupus affects the kidneys, and kidneys also regulates RBC. So that's why they are common also for the development of anemia. So try to see the the effect. The effect, uh, kidney has a role with the immune system. The skin has a role with the immune system. The, 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 the nervous system has a role with the immune system because of the immediate impulse transmission for compensatory mechanism. So these are enumerated autoimmune disease, and we must be aware how to protect them accordingly. Now, cancer. Cancer could, abnor uh, these are abnormal cells. Uh, which is specifically, if you say cancer, these are malignant, okay? So malignant, the malignant cells are the ones that once it causes its multiplication and overtake healthy cells. However, there are some situations like when the client undergoes or undergone the, 
the, the therapy, this affects the healthy cell because it is generalized uh, as, as a treatment and affects healthy cell. So that's why even a cancer may cause uh, an autoimmune, uh, it may cause the immunocompromise because it affects also the healthy cells. So the typical example, so we have the breast cancer, which is common for female, melanoma, which is common for the skin, leukemia, okay, we have mentioned that in the leukemia, which is very significant in the findings of the WBC, we have lymphoma for the nerve, uh, for the uh, lymph nodes, and lung cancer, and colorectal cancer, which is very com which are very common, okay? So, the, the lung cancer and the colorectal cancer and uh, are, are types of cancer which somehow, uh, based, from the, based from research, may have high degree of metastasis or the spread of cancer cells because these are highly nodular and highly vascular. Next, inflammatory diseases. So, inflammatory diseases, these are, could be acute or progressive. So, if it is acute, it could be the, the start or the onset progressive this could be uh, this could be at a time on a later age may experience so osteoarthritis so rheumatoid arthritis uh, 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 before i forget uh, usually the rheumatoid arthritis if the person may have lupus uh, she or he may have also rheumatoid arthritis that's why uh, that's why these are the common 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 complications when a person may have lupus because of the autoimmune, this is autoimmune disease, the arthritis that had been identified for, for lupus is uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why co very common very common treatment for them are, are steroids or corticosteroids or anti-inflammatory drug. However, in the inflammatory diseases which acute progressive damage to cells and tissues are osteoarthritis. So commonly, uh, the joints that are significantly affect the bone are, I know, these are more painful. These are more painful with the other types of arthritis. So because of the higher degree of inflammation. Pelvic inflammatory disease, these are very common for, for females. Viral uh, meningitis, uh, very common. It affects the meninges of the brain. Atherosclerosis, remember class. Sclerosis is, remember, uh, is pertaining to the hardening of the athero, meaning uh, fatty streaks of the coronary blood vessels. So these are inflammatory, okay? If there's hardening of the blood vessels, these are sclerosis by turn. And we have the fibromyalgia if these are usually uh, affecting the, the muscles, okay? So these are the inflammatory diseases, which if you are aware, then very common are anti-inflammatory drugs. If for autoimmune of immune diseases, which obviously affects the immune system, so uh, most of them, uh, most of the measures that, that will be done to them and prepared for them is to uh, prevent them to, to develop any, any type of infection upon exposure. So when we talk about the cancer, the degree itself may be different or may differ or may vary according to the location and the presence of uh, nodes and blood vessels. Next, other the, uh, under the, the inflammatory disease, we have the infectious disease infectious disease as what we have mentioned and discussed in the chain of infection we have bacteria virus fungus parasite that's why class wbc as an indicator in the diagnostic exam of infection it's very important for us to identify through the use of the w uh, wbc differential count which basically identifies if it is bacterial viral Parasite. That's why it identifies there's monocyte, uh, neutrophils, basophils, lymphocytes. So these are our indicators if what treatment could be. So human immuno, human immuno uh, virus or HIV is an infectious, okay, because it could be it, that the virus may transfer from one person to another through the bodily fluids, okay. And HIV could be also be identified as autoimmune disease because uh, usually uh, it affects the, the, the CD4 itself for HIV affects the immune system. Hepatitis C, okay, the inflammation of the liver, the Zika virus that I mentioned that may cause congenital anomalies among uh, affected pregnant women, 
tuberculosis and influenza are are common when it comes to the tuberculosis is bacterial and influenza could be viral in nature. So I may not discuss this further, but these are the list of some of the infectious disease. In the functional disease, uh, uh, usually those are the structural diseases and we have identified those categories. When it comes to the functional disease, these are diseases in which the onset begins with the presence of any lesion. So what do you mean by any lesion? These usually are the basic change on the physiologic and referred to as pathophysiologic change. So it, 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 it means that when we talk about when we talk about the functional disease, most of the most of the example is it starts from one and it appears to affect the multiple uh, organs or systems. That's why functional disease, most of the common, most of the common diseases, uh, examples of functional diseases are rare. Tension, headaches, and functional bowel syndrome. Usually the, the use of the syndrome, okay, the syndromes are usually identified in the functional disease. Mental deviations, okay, mental deviations are also are, are, are identified with functional disease. If you will identify, if you will identify in the structural disease, we have categorized it as autoimmune. We have categorized it as inflammatory. We have identified it with uh, other than the other than the inflammatory. Uh, the other two had been identified with the structural disease. While in the functional disease, these are these are diseases that are identified with syndromes, mental deviations, and and usually these are these are a combination of the such uh, manifestations. And this could not be. Uh, specifically identified if it is autoimmune, as unlike we have identified this autoimmune, inflammatory, if it is cancer. So it's under those categories. Unlike for functional disease, just like irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. Usually, irritable bowel syndrome is when you are experiencing, experiencing, um, uh, even though the person have un uh, have undergone diagnostic tests, but no findings at all. There are some situations that these are psychosomatic. If we say psychosomatic syndromes or manifestations that affect specific system, but still no identified, uh, no, no identified uh, particular and spe specific uh, diagnosis. So that's why if we say irritable bowel syndrome, uh, if you experience epigastric pain, lower epigastric, uh, epigastric pain, you experience diarrhea. But but specifically, it did not it, it, it did not identify a specific diagnosis because the tests have shown negative. So that's why most of the diagnosis that could be identified is irritable bowel syndrome. This is another very common and very common syndrome that we are using, chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome somehow may experience headache, body weakness, uh, body weakness. Then there is some joint pains, but Specifically, it did not identify specific specific problems with the system. Just like what we are, what we are, what we have mentioned on the structural disease. So combination of manifestations, but but no significant uh, disease has been identified. So that's why it's chronic fatigue syndrome. That's why if you experience tension, if you experience headache, body weakness, oh, baka it, uh, that's only chronic fatigue syndrome. Just like the same as if the person experiences epigastric pain, bloating of abdomen, diarrhea. Uh, if it is not been uh, diagnosed as dehydration, it could be irritable bowel syndrome. Another, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia could be identified specifically with body pain, body muscle pain. And it, it's, it is somehow located on the, any part of the body or multiple parts of the body. So if, 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 if the pain, the muscle pains have been identified in the in the different parts of the day, uh, in, uh, of the body rather, but no specific diagnosis at, at we, as well. They have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Another is we have temporomandibular joint pain. So if we have temporomandibular joint pain, so these are the pain that usually appears, that usually uh, that usually concerns on the part of the neck and the mandibular area. In short, steep neck. <laughs> okay, these are functional disease. This is not a this is not a structural disease, but it's a combination of, of joint pain. But but the, but it's a normal a normal tension only brought about by a normal tension, but no specific and identified diagnosis. Next, 
gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Okay, a gastro reflux disorder are usually identified right away when the, there's a reflux of the hydrochloric acid to the upper GI. But specifically, this is a functional disease because it did not identify gastritis. It did not identify esophagitis. It did not identify specific disorder of the gastrointestinal or digestive system because it only identifies a reflux of the hydrochloric acid. So GERD is a functional disease. Okay. Interstitial cystitis. If we say interstitial cystitis, there could be a presence of the formation of a cyst, but not yet identified and diagnosed. Okay. So that's why interstitial, it's only surface, on the surface of the skin. And sometimes on the presence of this inflammatory uh, cyst, if there are no biopsy at all, if negative biopsy as well, and if there in the formation is just an, an abnormal formation, but no significant uh significant major affectations it's in interstitial cystitis cystitis okay so another is i'm changing my slide so these are these are the examples of the difference with the structural and the functional disease is that of in the structural from the term itself structural it they are categorized under those diseases but for the functional in general Okay, a combination of those of those manifestations. So that's why it's it's according to the congenital anomalies, the uh, congenital anomalies of the World Health Organization. Congenital anomalies could be genetic, socioeconomic, socioeconomic because of most uh, identified that could not meet specifically the the nutritional needs, demographic factors, so by profile, by socioeconomic status, environmental factors infection, and uh, maternal nutrition status. So we have mentioned that we have already discussed this uh, genetics, but based from the studies, we have discussed also cyst cystic fibrosis and a prob hemophilia is a problem, is a blood uh, disorders also, which are high prevalence with genetic mutation for as Ashkenazi Jews or Finns. So ethnic communities, based from the, the studies, they are the high prevalence of cystic fibrosis and hemophilia by genes. So we have mentioned cystic fibrosis as single gene inheritance. For socioeconomic and demographics, usually 94% of congenital anomalies based from World Health Organization are the low and middle income countries because of the possibilities that it may not meet specifically the nutritional needs of the maternal uh, and the child as well. So probably these are the higher risk because of lack of access to sufficient nutritious foods. Uh, probably uh, those uh, individuals who are commonly ex uh, exposed to infection and alcohol if they don't have the knowledge and access to healthcare facility. So poorer access to maternal healthcare. For environmental factors, uh, maternal exposure, we have mentioned this right in the pharmacology on what are the uh, effects of the substance abuse to the neonatal, okay? So we have the medications, alcohol, tobacco, and radiation during pregnancy. So even pesticides and other chemicals, so be careful because this may cause congenital anomalies. Work or living conditions such as environmental uh, if they're exposed to various hazards. For infection, these are examples that may significantly ap uh, affect the, the middle and the low income. Uh, countries, syphilis, okay, maternal infections such as syphilis, and rubella. Rubella, measles, which are common and significant to low and middle income countries. So these are the common the infections that may lead to congenital anomalies according to WHO. And Zika, Zika virus, which has been reported of developing fetal anomalies or congenital anomalies. So we have also discussed before on maternal nutritional status on congenital anomalies. So polyp, Okay, the polyp insufficiency that may cause the neural tube defect, which is nerve, uh, affects the nervous system. It is a problem with polyp. And plus, excess in the vitamin A intake may cause also a uh, problem with the normal development of the embryo. So I think that ends up with the discussion of the, the etiology. So I will stop my sharing. Are there any, any questions from the class pertaining to the discussion? Um, our topic, our topic that had been discussed, or the topics that had been discussed this this afternoon, uh, may may basically help you on to even assess or make a genome, a genome, ano, a genome, genome diagram in your own families. If there are there are single inheritance, multifactorial inheritance, 
even mitochondrial inheritance on the uh, to in your family and and for you to know uh, this could be useful also the genome uh, diagram could be useful also as a presentation in the pathophysiology because this may validate and justify as well the the inheritance and genetics as a non modifiable risk factors so class do you have any questions class can you wala na po din. Okay, wala na. So, much as well, I will end up the I will end up the recording.